Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing super well. Today we'll be talking about seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Again, not the highest yield topic in existence, but you'll almost definitely get a few questions on these and these can be a bit trickier to navigate. So starting off with what we mean by the term seronegative. So, so far, most of the tests we've talked about, most of the inflammatory conditions we've talked about are associated with some form of serological markers, whether these be rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, these are serology markers, right? And there are a whole bunch of uh, forms of arthritis that don't have these markers present. These mostly affect the vertebral column and therefore are called, um, and not therefore, but they're called seronegative because they are, they don't have any serological markers present. The four main ones you need to know are reactive, ankylosing spondyloarthritis, psoriatic, and anthropathic. Most of them are HLA-B27 positive. Now, don't get this confused with the serology marker. Yes, it is seronegative, but is positive for HLA-B27. Well, it's because HLA-B27 is not a serological marker at all. But quite commonly, you might ask yourself, well, what is HLA-B27 in the first place? Why is it important? So HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen. Again, if this doesn't interest you, please skip forward. It is not super important to get the grasp or know what's important for exams, but it's really good to understand what's going on. So HLA are just a type of um, surface antigen. It stands for human leukocyte antigen. And it basically is a component of the MH1 or major histocompatibility protein 1 complex. This complex is found in all nucleated cells. And the HLAs specifically are found in immune cells, which makes sense because it's a leukocyte antigen, right? What we suspect happens is that because of, and I'm sure you've heard this before, a, a, a complex combination of genetic and environmental predisposing factors, right? That's the but like wordy answer to why it happened, but we don't really know. But what they do suspect is that HLA B27 binds to certain peptides. Peptides that may be found in from pathogens, so because of an infection, and it triggers an inappropriate activation of your Im entire immune chain. So your CD8 cells, um, you end up releasing interleukins, inflammatory markers, as well as osteoclasts. And osteoclasts fit into, I guess, the bride, the bride, bro the broader scheme picture of um, why we get musculoskeletal involvement with this particular autoimmune process. So you need, what you do need to know is a common associated the conditions with the HLA-B27. So a good mnemonic for that is a pair. So ankylosing spondyli spondylitis, psoriasis, acute anterior uveitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and reactive arthritis. Most of them also share a few extra articular features. So sacroiliitis or inflammation of the sacroiliac joints Anthocytis, which is inflammation of the tendons, and to uveitis, which we've talked about in Optal, but we'll cover very briefly here, and some specific stuff depending on which condition we're talking about. So the most important one is ankylosing spondylitis from um, a seronegative perspective, and also from your exam burden. It's the most common condition you'll be tested on when it comes to these um, seronegative conditions. So it's an inflammatory arthropathy, of the axial skeleton, um, and therefore it's also called radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. It's the other name for ankylosing spondylitis. So it's defined by inflammation, stiffness, and pain of the neck, back, and sacroiliac joint. So as you can see, it's axial. So what pattern of pain would you see with such an inflammatory arthropathy? Again, this is going back to the distinction between mechanical and inflammatory arthritis and the kind of pain they present with. So you would have dull pain with extended periods of morning stiffness, which is over 30 minutes. It improves with activity. It is independent of position, so it's not gravitational or mechanical. And you often also see uh, tenderness along the joint lines. So how does, again, ankylosing spondylitis happen? So we've already talked about what happens with the HLA-B27 side of things, a common environmental or viral trigger to the process. Once we then have the CD8 T-cell activation, the interleukin release, and the osteoclast hyperproliferation, we end up with inflammation, destruction, and 
disorganized formation of the vertebral column or the axial skeleton, which is where the issue lies, right? What happens with this is once you have this process of ongoing destruction and trying to catch up and rebuild it really quickly, you have disorganized growth where you actually end up joining or kind of the you you have a um fusion sorry that's the word i was looking for so you have a fusion of the vertebral bodies and this is what leads to the, the, the reduced spine mobility looking at this picture here as you can see ideally we want to have our vertebrae separated by the intervertebral discs allowing for flexion and extension which is how we get our mobility but again when you have inflammation to this degree then this organized reborn formation you end up with fusion of these processes, which becomes stiff, which is what the patients would present with in moderate to severe disease. Some extra articular manifestations, firstly, is anterior uveitis that we already touched upon. It is the most common manifestation of angst bond. Restrictive lung diseases, purely because of the effects on the uh, thoracic spine and the rib cage. You can also have fusion of the costovertebral joints as well, as you can see happening here. Inflammatory enthesitis and dactylitis, which can be seen here. So inflammation of the tendon insertions and also the fingers. GI symptoms, so IBD association. And then generally feeling unwell or rundown. So fatigue, fever, weight loss are the common non-specific symptoms they may present with. In terms of diagnosing angst bond, again, you have to start with a good history. Establish that pattern of inflammatory arthropathic back pain because most patients presenting with back pain are going to have a mechanical cause you want to obviously examine them and be sure to in your mind think that the severity of their science is going to correlate to the progression of their disease right so in mild disease you might only experience pain and tenderness at the spine and the sacroiliac joint line called that's assessed through the faber test in moderate disease, you might have mildly restri restricted spinal mobility. Severe disease, you would have drastically restricted spinal mobility, issues with breathing, kyphosis, scoliosis, and so forth. In doing that, you also always want to look for those extra articular manifestations that we talked about. So your anti-uveitis, IBD symptoms, and your oligoarthropathies, particularly with the hands, with the enthesitis and dactylitis. Some tests that you, the name isn't really super helpful, but you need to know what each one of these tests are. The Schober test is the one that's used most commonly to diagnose angst bond and is based on the principle of reduced spinal mobility, particularly during forward flexion. What we do is we ask the patient to stand. We measure two points, one at L5, um, so one at L5 and one 10 centimeters uh, sorry, one ten centimeters above. We then ask the patient to touch their toes, so forward extend to the best of their ability. And we then also measure the distance by which that point increased. If you have an increase in less than four centimeters, that itself is a positive test and makes you realize that this patient has reduced spinal mobility particularly in forward flexion, and that is a positive test. Correction, um, so you start off at, um, so you start off at the, so slight correction with a measuring of the points, sorry, my bad. So you first locate the iliac crest line, and that's by kind of palpating along and also um, looking at the dimples uh, in the lower back. You then go 10 centimeters above and five centimeters below. So that was my, correction so 10 centimeters above five centimeters below um, and you assess for the degree of increase you can also do a lateral lumbar flexion test same principle just asking them to bend to one side the favor test so it stands for flexion abduction and external rotation so this is done when um, they are laying down and Pain elicited on any of the above movements is a positive test for sacroiliitis. Sacroiliitis itself is not diagnostic of angst bond, but it is a very common association. And lastly, we have the Menel sign, which is tenderness to percussion 
Um, so we literally put costs along the SI joint and also try to manually manipulate the joint. So displacement of the joint, if that does elicit pain, that's a positive test for sacroiliitis. Uh, there you go. So 10 centimeters above the iliac crest and five centimeters below, you mark two lines, ask them to extend forward. And that's the Faber test on the right. In terms of imaging, you will get asked what is the first line imaging you want to do and what's the best imaging you want to do or like what's the diagnostic test. X-rays are the best initial test to confirm angst spawn, but you need to know that you will only see signs of ankylosing spondylitis in moderate to severe disease, right? You will not see early degenerative changes through an X-ray. Things you can see would be joint erosion, sclerosis. You can see fusion of the vertebral bodies, which is the ankylosis part of it. And that's the bamboo spine. So it looks like a bamboo stick. You can often see loss of lumbar lordosis on the lateral back X-ray, um, ossification of the vertebral bodies, which you can see there's this um, well demarcated bright line running down the back which are meant to be the vertebral bodies in isolation but you have ossification and fusion of them but most importantly early changes will not be seen you then have the MRI with a gadolinium contrast and the gadolinium itself can highlight areas of inflammation and it's the best test to identify early inflammatory changes of angst bond um, yeah, so again, if you get asked, initial test is x-ray, best test is MRI. In terms of treatment, again, it's going to depend on the severity. And I hope that by this point in the year, you have a general idea of what supportive is, medical and surgical therapies for most of your kind of broad overarching conditions. So um, supportive therapy, so you want to ensure that they are undertaking physiotherapy, lifestyle changes with smoking, supporting bone health, osteoporosis prevention, because fractures are another high risk complication for this group. In terms of medical, their back pain, you want to put them on NSAIDs if you can. But again, please be mindful of long-term NSAID use and its side effects. TNF alpha inhibitors are also good. And in advanced cases, we might consider intra-articular glucocorticosteroid injections and DMARD therapy. And this is the particular DMOD that I refuse to try to pronounce because I will fail miserably at trying. If the disease is severe, um, we can help with symptom control, but not cure it through surgical means. So um, spinal osteotomy and hip arthroplasty, where we try to separate or um, actually join the joint um, to prevent further movement and further pain. So it is purely for symptom control and is not curative. The other kind of seronegative arthritis that you need to know are reactive, psoriatic, and anthropathic. I've put this in the table because I think this is the extent of what you need to know. Reactive is often a reaction to an infection, so GIT or STI infections. Age of onset is quite similar throughout. The prevalence of sacroiliitis is highest in ankylosing spawned. Um, goes down across here. And in terms of systemic features, I've already linked everything else you would see. So these are really, the last bit is really important from an exam perspective. So with angst bond, your six A's of angst bond are anterior uveitis, atlantoaxial subluxation, which happens at the cervical neck um, and above, apical lung fibrosis, aortic regurg, autoimmune bowel disease, particularly UC of the two IBDs, and amyloidosis. Reactive because it is often linked with STIs, so balanitis and urethritis, and then also anterior uveitis, which has nothing to do with STIs, but is the extra articular manifestation that we said is quite commonly seen. With psoriatic, um, obviously it's linked to psoriasis, and you would in most cases see um, a silver extent, silvery extensor rash and nail changes, but we'll talk about psoriasis in our derm series. And then we have enteropathic, which is linked to acute flare-ups of IBD, no real sacroiliitis association, and obviously it's going to be commonly associated with um, UC um, and Crohn's. You can also see kind of primary blurry sclerosis, skin tags, and fistulas that often may be linked with the broader scheme of um, autoimmune kind of presentations. And that is all we had for seronegative spondyloarthropathies or arthritis. 
I hope that all made sense. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you're all doing well with your exam prep and your year is cruising along well. As always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.